This tiny jewel was recovered from the wreck site of the Spanish Armada ship, the Girona, which sank off the Antrim coast in 1588. It's a pendant in the shape of a salamander, a mythical creature, but one based on a real Mexican lizard. People believed a salamander could survive and extinguish fire, which made it the sort of lucky charm sailors on board a wooden fighting ship wanted to have with them. It shows the wealth and extent of the great Spanish empire in the 16th century. Gold from the New World, rubies imported from places like Burma or Thailand. This salamander lay on the seabed off the Antrim coast for nearly 400 years and is a reminder of the importance of the sea as a connecting link between peoples and places. Overcoming adversity, remarkable true life stories in my story in half an hour. A local murder case solved first on BBC One Northern Ireland as our series In Cold Blood continues. The programme contains images and scenes that you may find upsetting. Donaghadee is a quiet seaside town, a place where many older people retire to enjoy the sea air and the views. An idyllic spot perhaps, but for 77-year-old Tilly Campbell, it became the stuff of nightmares. of the 9th of October 2006 as Tilly Campbell lay sleeping an intruder shattered the early morning silence I'm just walking over to our care centre, but the house that I've just walked past, because there seems to be smoke coming out of some of the windows. And Barna Park. Barna? Yeah, and then I get out. Shortly after 10 to 6 on Monday, 9th of October, I was alerted for my regional control centre by a pager to turn out to take charge of an incident of a house fire. Forty-six Barna Park is a semi-detached bungalow in a quiet area of the town. It was owned by widow Tilly Campbell, and on first arriving at the scene, firemen were hopeful that the fire was not extensive. However, on closer inspection, it appeared the house had been broken into, and the officers were immediately concerned for possible occupants. Within a few minutes after that time, um, one of the firefighters came out to say that they found someone and to get the resuscitation equipment ready for the casualty being brought out. Basically, once, once the, the, the crews had sat the lady down, it, it was apparent very quickly that uh, due to the horrific injuries that she had sustained, that uh, life was extinct.
As the victim's injuries were not fire-related, Assistant Group Commander Stanley Bentley entered the building himself to try to determine the cause of the fire, suspecting foul play. I looked and I found two seats of fire. There was one just outside a bedroom. Um, it was set to, to a chair which led to um, a hot press that, that was, was completely destroyed by fire and there was a second attempt to fire at a mattress in, in an adjoining bedroom. At this stage I believed and I knew I was dealing with more than a fire incident and a fire fatality. Uh, this was due to the injuries that Tilly Campbell had received and the fact that the rear door had been forced the fact there was two seats of fire and also that we'd found a knife in um, one of the bedrooms. Uh, it was then that I had to make the decision to preserve the scene as much as possible. In the meantime, fire crews continued their duties, ensuring the flames had not spread to adjoining properties. Hello, anyone home? Tilly's immediate neighbour was on holidays, but her son was at home. Firemen had difficulty rousing him and were surprised he had not responded to the arrival of emergency services hours earlier. They entered to check that the fire next door had no ill effects on persons or property. Went up and checked the roof space, which found a considerable amount of smoke, but no fire passage had, had made its way through. So they were, they were content at the fact that no fire had, had travelled through into that home. Robert Harvey explained he had just woken up after a heavy drinking session, but officers noticed the washing machine was on. It just didn't add up the fact that if he was sleeping, his washing machine was on and uh, basically was not emotional to the fact that there had been a fire next door. The firemen informed police on the scene about their suspicions and two officers went back to speak with Robert Harvey. When we went to knock on the door, there was no answer. Uh, the house appeared to be in darkness and it was quiet. I thought this was a bit strange as the fire service had just spoken to the occupant a few minutes previously. I knocked on the door a number of times and there was no answer, so I consulted with my colleague and we decided that due to the, the evidence that we already had and our suspicions, that we would uh, have to force entry to speak to the occupant. Where's your washing machine? I opened up the door of the washing machine and observed it to be full of clothing. I started to remove the clothing as I wasn't sure whether the washing machine might let more water in at some stage had left it. I set the clothing on the floor and happened to notice a pair of trainers in the washing machine as well. The first thing that came to mind was you'll ruin your drum by putting trainers in your washing machine. And I decided to say this to Robert Harvey, uh, just to see if I could build up some rapport with him. He didn't make any reply or his facial expression didn't change at all. Robert Harvey then left the kitchen and made his way towards one of the bedrooms. I followed him as I wanted to keep him in sight at all times. He sat down in his bed and picked up a paintbrush and began to paint on a, an easel which he had just beside the bed. So you're an artist? Yeah. At his feet, I noticed there was what appeared to be scissors, a hatchet, and a jammy lying in a small pile. I asked him what was the, the purpose of the tools that were lying on the floor. He says he had them for his own protection. When I entered 48 Barna Park, Robert Harvey remained calm throughout. He was neither obstructive or particularly helpful, but uh, he didn't make any expression as to why the police were forcing their way into his house. When I mentioned to him that Tilly Campbell was dead, he did show surprise, which appeared genuine. Uh, he made a few comments, but then he immediately returned to his calm state. As a result of uh, Robert Harvey's actions, in which he failed uh, to uh, respond to the fire service, he failed to respond to the police officers knocking the door. 
on police entering the property and finding a number of weapons. On finding the washing machine uh, where clothes had recently been washed. And the fact that Tilly Campbell had been brutally murdered in her home. Uh, officers at the scene, under the direction of local CID, arrested Robert Harvey on suspicion of murder. Tilly Campbell was a 77-year-old widow and grandmother who lived in Donegadee for nearly 60 years. She'd only moved to Barna Park following the death of her husband in November 2004. Tilly was a strong-willed and popular woman, but had become increasingly more housebound due to ill health. She was unable to walk or carry items for long distances, but was saving for a mobility scooter to maintain her independence. I first heard about my mother's death it must have been the, around half six, seven o'clock or something on the Tuesday morning. I can't really remember. Uh, and it was my son come running into my bedroom to say that my brother had phoned to let him know that my mother was dead and there had been a fire in the house. I just got up and threw things on me, get into the car and just drove an autopilot, really. I can't remember a lot more driving down to Donegade to see what had happened. The information we were given, from what I can remember, I don't think it was a lot, just that there was a fire. We didn't know that she was murdered at the time. And everything, like, really, to me, it was a blank. When I got down there, you know, the, my uncle and he was already there with the police. They more or less told me what had happened. And I just, I, I, you know, you're devastated, you know, but you just, you're numb. You, I didn't know what to do. It was just a shock. The morning that I found out that Tilly had been murdered, I was getting ready for work, and it was early. It was about seven-ish. And I was upstairs. Partner was downstairs. The knock came to the door. And at that time of the morning, you do wonder, but it was dawn. And I thought that she had fallen, that Tilly had fallen again because she fell before. But it was dawn coming in to tell me that his mother was dead, and there had been a fire. And I went into hysterics. When Robert Harvey was arrested and taken to the serious crime at, at uh, Antrim, he undergoes a process of uh, forensic recovery. We uh, take uh, swabs of his hand, we take head hair combings, etc. We also see uh, the clothing that uh, he was wearing. At the time of his arrest, he was wearing a dark coloured uh, hooded top, boxer shorts and a pair of slippers. They would have been removed from him and he would have been supplied with uh, a police issue boiler suit. When I find out that he was arrested, I was, you know, I was so angry because he lived next door to my mum and I just couldn't believe that anybody could do anything like that, especially to my mum. I only seen him now and again, but you never really seen his face because he always had hoods and kept his head down. I didn't really know what he looked like. Despite the fact that Robert Harvey was well known to local police, there was a feeling of incredulity throughout the community that he could have murdered his defenceless neighbour. A post-mortem was carried out on uh, Tilly Campbell's body. As a result of that post-mortem, the pathologist stated that he believed the cause of death was a result of multiple injuries, however, most notably uh, extensive head injuries uh, resulted in Tilly's death. Tilly Campbell had extensive defence wounds to her upper and lower arms and that would be consistent with Tilly having put up um, quite a, a struggle with her assailant um, and it is clear to us that Tilly did fight back. 